It is great and very, very inspiring to be here. I find it impossible for me as an entrepreneur not to get inspired when I look at TED.com, inspired to do great deeds. And the people that speak at TED, I, I feel so small here right now. They are amazing people and they do extraordinary work, right? And they make it look all so very easy. Even when they've just told you for 20 minutes that it took them 30 years of work and studies to get to this particular point, it still feels like they knew it was always going to happen, right? They knew it was always going to be worth it. And I find that truly inspiring. When I first came to TED a couple of years ago, I started watching all the videos religiously. And um, what I was thinking every night as I was looking at these videos was, why haven't I heard of this before, right? Why isn't every news source in the world reporting about every video that comes out of TED? I have, I have no idea. Why, furthermore, aren't all these ideas heavily funded or even implemented? Huh? If they were, the world would be saved three times over. <laughs> and I would have all those great things that they show up there, all those things that I saw in the science fiction books when I was a kid, talking about the great future. Then, realization struck. Somebody is cheating me out of my flying car. Where is my flying car? <laughs> and when I take my tinfoil hat off and think about this, I realize that there is no great conspiracy stopping me from cruising around the sky. The key word here is implementation. And implementation of big and radical ideas is hard and it takes time for many different reasons and some of them are even good reasons, I think. The only area where this, this doesn't seem to hold true is the internet. The internet is the ultimate playground for the free thinker and the entrepreneur, right? Where every individual have godlike disruptive powers if they choose to have them. And I understand why that scares a lot of people. And I think it starts like, sounds like the perfect place for a new venture. My uh, first venture was 10 years ago. And I was going to make a feature film, and that feature film was going to change the world. Uh, <laughs> and um, I funded it together with a friend and our dot-com cash and my parents took a loan and I took a loan and then there were these credit cards and then, well, um, at least the failure was big enough to warrant a documentary on national TV and I did get to learn quite a lot of stuff. And the most important thing that I learned, I think, was to dream big but start small. So this time around, I was going to start here in Sweden and I'm going to start with the small topic of uh, public education. In uh, Sweden every year, we spend roughly 6% of our gross national product on education. And every year, we crank out this new batch of teachers. People that have spent the last four and a half years, or even more, becoming the best teachers possible. Right? And it's all paid for by our generous and hard-working taxpayers. All for the betterment of society and our generations to come. That is truly a beautiful thing, and I think it is one of our greatest achievements as a species. But the question is, what do we then do with these teachers? Right? We have the new batch that are young and hungry and have great minds, and we have all the previous batches that are more experienced, that have thousands of hours of education behind them. We have this collection of great minds, different personalities, and different teaching styles. What do we do with these people? Well, we um, put them in a room each, and then we run this great national lottery, where we take all our students, and um, the lottery depends on sort of, you know, 
how well off are your parents, and where do you happen to be living at the time of the lottery, then we take 25 to 30 of you and we stick you in a room with this teacher. And the teacher and the students are stuck together for years to come. And what do we do then? We hope for the best. That's what we do. Now, maybe you probably see where this is going. I hope so, because it's sort of obvious, and you're all probably clever people. I can't really see you, but you're probably all clever people. <sighs> but before I get to the how of uh, you know, how we save the world and make everything better, I want to talk a little bit more about the why. Why do this? And I think that everybody here had a favorite teacher, right? I had one. His name was Peter Bevman. He was my junior high uh, art school teacher. And every class that he had, I loved. Every technique that he taught, I still remember to this day. And a word of encouragement for that man motivated me to no end. And I knew then and there that I was going to be working with something, something artistic sometime in my life. And thank you, Peter, wherever you are. However, in contrast, there was also my high school teacher. Let's call him Bob. Now, Bob put me off artistic endeavors for very many years, and I hated every single second with that man. And this national teacher lottery had provided me with both ends of the spectrum. And it was a pure fluke that I discovered art later in life and actually ended up making it my profession. When uh, starting off this project, we uh, did a bit of research. And we asked people about their favorite teachers. What is it that makes a teacher great? What qualities does such a person exhibit? Hmm? Why do you go to one teacher's classes but skip another's? And the interesting thing is that the data we got back was all over the place, just like the sound on this mic. Um, and even when we removed the most obvious and extreme data points of weird answers from students, such as, um, I want my teacher to be an evil tyrant, and uh, my favorite one was, um, I don't like nice people. Teenagers come in all different flavors. Even when you remove that, you still end up with data all over the place, right? There is no nice bell curve distribution of data. There is no center point where there is a good teacher. What we ended up with was, in fact, something that very much resembles what Malcolm Gladwell talked about at a TED talk when he spoke about Howard Mokowitz and his research in the food industry when it came to consumer choice and how consumer choice led to increased happiness. So, um, we realized that, that there is no perfect teacher, right? There are only perfect teachers. Just like in the food industry, there is no perfect pickle, only perfect pickles. There is no perfect ketchup, I like regular, you like extra chunky. Who knows? And when I was in London last year, I was making pretty pictures for the American film industry. Uh, in the hustle and bustle of Soho pub life, I uh, ran into an old friend from Sweden. And we started talking about the old days, you know. It turned out that he was in the same field as me. And we were doing approximately the same thing, but we'd had different lives. And when I was, as a young man, out and gallivanting around the world, he did the responsible thing. And he went to art college. And in art college, he had this one professor that he could not stop talking about, that he loved, that inspired him. That teacher was Bob. Bob had risen to become a college lecturer, and now it inspired my friend. So we again have the situation of, you know, regular ketchup for me, extra chunky ketchup for you, and evil tyrant ketchup for my friend. Um, the thing is, 
it seems like luck then provides you with the best or the worst possible teacher, right? The question is, why leave it to chance? In this country, where there is ubiquitous internet, why leave it to chance? I mentioned Malcolm Gladwell before. He wrote a book called Outliers, which if you haven't read Outliers, you should, because it is an amazing book. And it inspired us a lot in this project. In Outliers, Gladwell talks about how chance led people that became successful to where they are, and how it took a lot of hard work, but they needed the opportunity in order to do that hard work to become successful. And it takes approximately 10,000 hours of work to become excellent at anything. That's what it took Bill Gates in order to become excellent. That's what it took Bill Joy in order to become excellent enough, at least, to write the code that the internet runs on. And that's what it took Mozart to become an excellent composer. 10,000 hours. What they all have in common as well is that they had the opportunity to do those 10,000 hours. My own 10,000 hours, I got a massive head start on because of one very simple phenomena that we already know about. It was online video training. And for the first year or so, I was scouring around the internet, trying to find whatever free stuff was out there. And then I found this, found this one school called FXPHD. It was formed by uh, visual effects professionals. And they provided high quality teaching for download. And bless their hearts, because that's when my life changed. All of a sudden, I was able to study anywhere, study anything, as much as my brain could swallow, wherever I was, doing whatever menial task I had to do in order to support myself, I could start becoming an expert. And for the first part of this time, I was even bedridden. I was lying in bed recovering from a back injury, and all I had was my laptop. But with their instructions, I could see a clear path from where I was here, lying in bed, to where success was. And I could see the path in between. And I could see that all that it required was hard work. 10,000 hours, but hard work. And that motivated me to no end. And I think it does. When you see that all your dreams can come true, if you only work hard, that is motivation. I think it truly is. And when you're motivated, it is easy to spend eight to 10 hours a day training. And it's not only easy if you have the opportunity, but it is also an amazing thing to do to your brain. I felt like um, Neo from The Matrix when he gets upgraded to do Kung Fu. You know, it was a great trip. And I think about a word, the other word for teacher, which is pedagogue. Now, pedagogue from the Latin roughly translates as the slave that walks your children to school and instructs them on the way. It's a nice word. Um, at least I thought that in high school about my teachers, that they were my slaves. But um, I found that I had a pedagogue on my laptop, somebody instructing me, instructing me and nurturing my ambitions wherever I went. I was starting to get the taste for something. And I think that every teacher has a certain topic that they love, or a certain subject that they've had a lecture on a hundred times, that they now have got down to fine art. And I think that that lecture should be recorded. I think that that lecture should be made into an easily consumable piece of education with just the right taste for you. Maybe extra chunky ketchup. And in Sweden, with this fairly, very modest population of 9 million people, um, we have at least 100,000 practicing teachers with at least four and a half years of university education, which means that they have at least 10,000 hours. Right? They are, in fact, 
excellent at what they do. And what do we do? We put them in a room and they teach 30 kids. Why not teach everybody? I am not advocating that we remove schools or teachers and replace them with video feeds because I don't think that this is the only way that people learn and I don't think that that's the only purpose of schools. Schools have lots of different purposes. But it's a bit like when we went from an oral tradition to a written tradition. Nothing really happened until this Gutenberg fella stepped onto the stage. And then everything took off. You no longer had to be in a monastery in order to get some reading done. All of a sudden, there was a new opportunity for learning. And we still have the oral traditions. And we still read books. But I cannot think of one compelling reason for not making education available to everyone, everywhere, all the time. I really can't. If nothing else, then we should do it for the kids that actually want to learn more. Or for the kids that have learning disabilities, where video training is a great tool. Uh, Bill Gates gave a TED talk not that long ago, uh, where he first released a bunch of mosquitoes into the crowd, and then he talked about education. And he cited research that said that the top quartile of teachers are able to, in a single year, increase their class performance by 10%. But the thing is, even if a teacher wants to become, you know, part of that top quartile, how do they do it? Because they, they have no way of measuring. They have 30 kids. That's a very small sample of data. That gives you nothing. And this is what the internet excels at. Data gathering. If you are in control of how the data is created, and then you can see how the data is being used and what results it have, and you as a teacher get instant feedback on how your education works, then mining this data is trivial. And if you make that data available freely to schools and teachers, then improving as a teacher becomes a simple case of refinement and iteration. That's it. And this becomes a sort of self-driving system where the only thing that needs to, to happen is something that is hap hopefully happening sometimes anyway, which is student studying. I think it sounds like a good idea. The question is how? How do you do it? Because I don't think the answer is putting up video cameras in all classrooms and recording everything. I think that would give you a massive amount of data that nobody could curate. It would just be noise. I think you need a great internet tool to do this. And you need to help teachers to do this, to put their education out there. And I think this needs to be free for both schools and teachers. And it needs to have all the best features for you know, recording and um, improving education. And free is important here. It needs to be free, not just free as in beer, but free as in rights. These people need to have an open tool that they can do whatever they want with in order to make the, make the best education possible. And this will take a lot of time and a lot of money and a lot of effort. And, you know, the question of implementation that we started with rears its ugly head again. Who do we go to to ask for permission to do this? No one. We are, in fact, already doing this. Uh, and we know already that there are enough teachers out there to get this going, to get this started, because we've speak, spoken to them. And our tools are already being developed. And this summer, they will be in beta. And the educational program for the teachers is already being developed and will be distributed 
along with the beta. This is happening this year. Next year, this will be in effect here in Sweden. And if we can do it in Sweden, and it's not happening anywhere else, then we'll just go global. But we'll start here. Right? The thing is, somebody else is most likely already doing this. Because it is a bloody obvious idea. You know? And there's lots of clever people out there. And there's probably some private venture, some or maybe a non profit like ours, or an institution like TED doing this. And if there is, that's great because then we will have already gotten what we wanted. And uh, I can get back to doing other things. But hopefully we can be another facet in the beautiful diamond that is public education. And hopefully it will be another step on the road to equal opportunity for all, as well as an increase in choice. And I'm not sure if we can provide for the one student that didn't like nice people. Um, but hopefully we can be somebody else's extra chunky ketchup. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.